I'm, I'm a urologic oncologist uh, and also a prostate cancer researcher, uh, both at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutch um, Cancer Center here in Seattle. I, I think physicians aim to treat everyone the same, but uh, you know, there are biases, uh, implicit uh, biases. There are issues that surround just institutional access to care and structural issues that can impact the way we deliver care. But on an individual basis, Perhaps physicians don't see themselves as being biased uh, or providing different types of care, but you know, insurance status, um, location, there are so many factors that create barriers um, that can actually impact the type of care an individual receives. When we talk about cultural competency, it, it's, it's, it's not just about language, but it's about understanding what values an individual has. The things that you value are gonna be very different from the things that I value. And creating, creating systems that allow us to tap into that sort of component of an individual patient's experience and priorities is important. One of the things I struggle with as a, as a disparities researcher is uh, we take this social construct, um, which is race, and we say uh, we apply a lot of biology and, and other things to it indiscriminately. Uh, perhaps as someone who's part of the African diaspora here in the United States um, that is uh, emigrated because of education may actually have a social and economic standing that's much different than a urban, you know, black American who's been in the uh, you know, in this country for, um, whose family has been in this country for a much longer time and experience a very different social uh, pressure that's you know, rooted in things like racism, um, poverty, et cetera. And so we have to disentangle a lot of these social um, constructs when we start thinking about race and, and the provision of care. We know that um, black men and men of color receive their care at different institutions and their counterparts. You know, there is a deeply rooted history of mistrust uh, with the medical community uh, here in the United States that, that goes back, you know, all the way back to slavery. And so, yes, I think the experience uh, that one uh, has as a man of color uh, with the healthcare system is really different. It is a very different relationship, and it's one that's hard for um, people on the outside to sometimes understand, right? Because you, you need care. Imagine having a cancer diagnosis, but not feeling that you can fully trust the providers that are out there trying to take care of you. For some folks, that might not make sense at all. But for others, that's a really, uh, that's a real and lived experience. Obviously, things like Tuskegee are among the most egregious offenses that uh, the medical community has imparted on the black community, but there have been instances that go a long way about the history of how medical uh, uh, research was done prior to patient protection. And so it's not just the black community, but any vulnerable population really has a history of, of you know, being taken advantage of uh, in medical research uh, prior to the protections that we have in place now. But those things become part of your narrative, right? As a community, if these are things that you experience over and over again, and it's something that's affected you on a generational standpoint, then it's hard to turn around and really want to engage in, in things like research or care uh, unless it feels like it's an absolute must, you know? And so to your point, things like the uniforms may keep people at arm's length. When I was a trainee, my chairman always refused to wear a white coat. And he said that, you know, he felt that it was more humanizing for him to just walk into the clinic room with his shirt and tie on than to have that white coat. He felt it was a barrier to patients. And, and that's something that always stuck with me, that the little things that we do um, can help build relationships and trust. Um, something as simple as taking off that, that white coat. The number of new cancer diagnoses in a given year. And if you look at incident cases for prostate cancer, black men are 70% uh, more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer than men of all other races. And that in of itself sort of introduces uh, some interesting hypotheses as to why that would be. You know, the, the easy one that 
folks always try to point towards is biology. Um, and certainly biology probably plays some role because we know that prostate cancer is a high, highly heritable disease. So we know men who have strong family histories are more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. But you can also think about how environment and social constructs could lead to exposures, um, life stressors that might actually be pro-cancer. So a pro-inflammatory state, for instance, might be something that uh, is more likely to uh, have, uh, lead to a malignancy in a man. And so there's a lot to disentangle in that incidence um, number for black men. On the other side, you have mortality. So are, are you more likely to die from prostate cancer? And we know black men in the United States are over two times more likely to die from prostate cancer um, compared to men of other races or ethnicities. And that I think highlights additional challenges because you know, if you wanted to be a cynic and say, well, if you're 70% more likely to have cancer, so you should die at a rate 70% more, then we still have excess death above what the incidence disparity is. Yeah, and I would argue that really what we're, we're what we should be fighting for is parity in, in outcomes uh, related to death. And so then you start thinking about sort of equity model of care. So how much more do we need to do for uh, black men in the United States for them to have similar outcomes to, to men other, around them. And, and that really starts to get to, at least for me, as a, in my current view of this issue, you start to get pretty far away from biology only solutions. And you really start to drive more towards what I call health services. So what can we provide then with regards to screening and treatment that will create better outcomes for them? There are so many diseases in the United States both within cancers and outside of cancers, where we see disparities in outcomes that are more pronounced in you know, the black community and, and communities of color. Within cancer, definitely the largest racial disparity you see is in prostate cancer. We try to look at biologic um, solutions for this, but there probably is a systems issue that reflects access to care and utilization of care um, just as much, if not more, um, than a biology issue. There have been several studies that have shown uh, that with equal access to care, that disparities seem to decrease markedly, or in some instances you have parity with regards to prostate cancer outcome. Black men are more likely to present with advanced stage disease and more, and some studies have suggested more aggressive disease. So this goes back to this idea for me that the, the solution isn't just give everyone access to treatment. And in some of the VA studies, the veteran affairs study that you have highlighted suggests the same thing that again, uh, when, when you look at groups of men who've had treatment, that the, the outcomes are pretty similar. But you gotta think about what is happening on the front end of that. You know, how are men getting screened? How are they how are their cancers getting detected? Are they getting detected early enough that you can actually apply that intervention and reduce their risk of dying from cancer? To date, there is no clear biologic signal that says, hey, this is why black men have a higher risk of being diagnosed or higher risk of dying from prostate cancer. When I think about disparities on the population level, then it seems like the biology starts to become less significant in that equation. You know, there are so many great questions with regards to environment. You can think of environmental exposures. You can think about life stressors as being things that could uh, impact your, your cancer risk. But I think that we have examples in the medical literature of you know, stress being uh, a source of disease. You know, we see it in cardiac literature and, and other places. So yeah, I, certainly I, I think that it's a, it's a hypothesis worth investigating. It's probably a, a hypothesis that is hard to solve without large structural changes. Now, when you look at the global burden of prostate cancer, the highest rates of mortality actually are in places with large populations of men of African descent. So West Africa, the Caribbean, you know, or the US or among places with the highest rates. The question is, what is driving that? 
as far as those rates, of, those high rates of prostate cancer death. And, you know, I don't know how much uh, of that can be placed just on environment and stress. I mean, there are other things like access to care and that, that are common threads that are shared between those different locales. Uh, but I think the concepts and the frameworks that might ameliorate um, disparities in the United States hopefully can be expanded to other global areas where the burden of disease is high. And the rate of, of uh, uh, participation uh, of, uh, or inclusion, I should say, of black men in, in clin clinical trials for prostate cancer has been really low, it's low single digit percentages. So there has been marked underrepresentation. I, I think we have to start by applying standard of care therapies to everyone. So, you know, if, if a drug has been shown to reduce risk in, 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 in a randomized controlled trial up, upheld to the highest standard, I think the starting place is making sure that men of color and, you know, men who, you know, are, are disadvantaged in some way are having access to that standard of care therapy. The next thing that's the onus that's upon us as a field then is to to think about how we we are more inclusive in our future trials so that we don't have to keep asking this question of well the you know this population wasn't well represented is this treatment going to be sufficient for them we have a lot of work to do in this space that's for sure but we're at a nexus where we really need to start having meaningful impact that leads to the reduction in, in that death difference between black men and men of other uh, races and ethnicities. And, and truthfully, I think finding th those solutions that create parity are gonna be beneficial for all men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so that's the goal. The goal is, is to, to improve outcomes and survivorship and quality of life and all those things for all men. And I think uh, one great strategy for achieving that is looking at our highest risk, most vulnerable populations and addressing their issues. And I really believe that that will create a better um, outcomes for everyone.